Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson, and welcome to Space Matters. I am so excited to share with you today's panel of fusion, vision, antimatter, and the interstellar roadmap. Please help me welcome Mr. Jeff Grayson, Chairman of the Board of the Tau Zero Foundation and Chief Technologist of Electric Sky, Dr. Jerry Jackson of HBAR Technologies, Dr. Steve Howe and Dr. Troy Howe of Howe Industries, and Dr. Ryan Weed of Positron Dynamics. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Hi, I'm Rhonda. Thank you again for joining Space Matters. And today we have uh, Dr. Troy Howe, uh, the CEO of Howe Industries. Troy, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so Howe Industries is basically dedicated to addressing space issues with power and propulsion um, and seeing how we can kind of improve on that by adding a little bit of nuclear technology and pushing the state of the art with new, new devices. Great. We also have Dr. Ryan Weed with us. Uh, he is the United States Air Force Experimental Test Pilot, um, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Con Concepts Fellow, and Positron Physicist dedicated to the human exploration of our solar system and beyond. He's the founder of Positron Dynamics. Ryan, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so positron dynamics in general is just doing something really easy and simple. We're just making an antimatter rocket engine. <laughs> uh, so it's just, uh, <laughs> uh, but we've been working on it for, uh, you know, almost uh, five or five or six years now. Um, so excited at the progress we've made so far and uh, happy, happy to be here chatting about it. Great. And then we also have Dr. Jerry Jackson of HBAR Technologies with us. Jerry, can you uh, elaborate on what HBAR Technologies is up to these days and a little bit more about your background? Yeah. Uh, Steve and I started HBAR Technologies almost 20 or 19 years ago now. Uh, and uh, one of the early things we did was we became NIAC fellows on the original incarnation of NIAC. And uh, then, so that was in 2002. Then there was some more funding in 2006. And then now we were funded in 2020 uh, with uh, the help of Jeff Grayson here. And so uh, it's been kind of hit or miss in terms of getting government funding. In the interim, we actually got a Kickstarter funded. Uh, it wasn't much money, but it was a good foray into crowdsourcing for sort of uh, fun scientific research and, and using the crowdfunding um, platform for seeing if we can't uh, further human exploration. Great, and then next we have Jeff Grayson of uh, the Tau Zero Foundation. He's the board chairman, and he is also the chief technologist at Electric Sky. Jeff, take it away. Well, at Tau Zero Foundation, I kind of maintain a, an industry-wide portfolio of keeping in touch with all the people on the screen and a lot of people who aren't on the screen of uh, what's going on in advanced propulsion worldwide. Uh, my own interests uh, really are in the non-rocket propulsion field right now, just because that's where I see a lot of um, potential, a lot of unexploited things. Um, but it's a it's an all of the above portfolio. I, I'm not I'm not involved there to pick a favorite technology or run with it. I'm looking for ways to put the pieces together into interstellar flight concepts that really work, uh, and uh, that involves drawing kind of the best from everybody. Uh, and then my other hat at the at Electric Sky dovetails neatly because Electric Sky is a beamed power and beam power propulsion company, and beam power continues to appear as one of the relevant technologies on the portfolio of, of advanced propulsion. So they dovetail nicely. Great, and then we also have Dr. Steve Howe, uh, who is the senior researcher at Howe Industries. Dr. Howe, can you tell us a little bit more about what your activities are? Sure, thanks for having me, Rhonda. Um, I was at Los Alamos National Lab for 22 years and started looking at nuclear thermal rockets uh, while there. I left Los Alamos in 2005 to become the founding director of the Center for Space Nuclear Research at the Idaho National Laboratory. 
between there, I worked with Jerry Jackson on antimatter and HBAR technologies uh, and working on the NIACs. And then in 2015, I left uh, the CSNR to join Howe Industries as a chief scientist, where I try to find new ideas for the company to look at. So I try to think them up, and then Troy does the work. <laughs> Great. One of the terms that keeps coming up that, that I think our audience should better understand, and, and Ryan, if you could answer this for us, what is uh, NASA's Innovative Advanced um, Concepts and what is an IAC? What, does, what is the significance of that? Well, at its most simple, it's, uh, it's money to do research. Um, it's an organization of, of people funded through NASA that are specifically geared towards what we call low TRL, or low technology readiness level. Uh, so we're talking high risk, high reward, uh, well, far out there concepts like antimatter propulsion. So this is right up the alley of, of what we call NIAC uh, work. Um, it's kind of, a, I, I like to compare it to the DARPA model uh, in Department of Defense, uh, where you're working on very hard, uh, hard projects and hard concepts. Um, uh, but they do have an, a lab aspect um, and they have been published in, in, in the literature. Um, so they're not too crazy, uh, but they have the, I guess, the potential if they do work to kind of change change how we do things. And and, and NASA is uh, forward looking enough to to have a whole group of, of people every year selected to to work on these projects. So. All right, and Jeff, since you wear so many hats and you're pulling from lots of different components within the space industry, can can you explain how? Um, these companies and these organizations um, pool resources and work together uh, to advance propulsion and to advance some of the things that everyone's involved in? Well, it, it's largely cooking stone soup. I mean, the, the um, you know, NIAC is almost all of the institutional funding in the United States for advanced propulsion. Um, and it's What's the total budget, Ryan? Ten million dollars yeah. uh, for all of NIAC. Um, uh, you know the the so people people really have this this belief that you know somewhere in the U.S. government is this is this you know giant pool of people in white coats who are working on this stuff all the time, and it's so not true. There, there's almost no funding for advanced concepts and advanced technology and advanced propulsion. Uh, the so, you know, we all, a lot of people who work in the field um, are academics. They're, they're tenured and they can work on it, you know, with their left hand uh, or their late career. Uh, and they've already, you know, gotten to the point where they're comfortable so they can afford to work on this stuff. Or they're, you know, brand new and entering the field as, as young professionals and, you know, have not got to the point yet where they have uh, families and houses they have to pay for so that they can afford to do it for very little. Um, but it's, it's really an almost all volunteer force and, and the little, you know, you can work for years to get one of these NIAC grants and their phase one grants are like a hundred K, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's really, uh, an effort that's a labor of love by almost all the participants who are doing it because they think it's important. Um, and it's really frustrating to be frank. Um, how many good ideas there are out there where 50 or 100 or 200 K of funding would really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Jackson, you had um, mentioned in a, in a conversation, I think a few days ago, that there has been um, a recently announced NIAC award, am I correct? Yeah, a couple of days ago, they just announced the new phase one recipients. And, and those were all folks that are within private industry or? No, actually, I was astonished at the large number of people internal to NASA who received those, those grants. Okay, so if you, if you take separate out the, the two-thirds of the grants that do not go to advanced propulsion, and then you take the fact that about half of that yet again is NASA um, taking the money internally, there is, for us, those of us out here on the outside, there's almost no money. It's, it's almost zero. So I guess my question, and specifically for um, how the, the folks at Howe Industries, why are we still bound um, near Earth space? I mean, I thought that nuclear rockets were something that um, was a given back in the 50s. Well, you want me to take that, Troy? Or? Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. I mean, that's a question we, we always ask. Uh, nuclear thermal rocket was well, 22 different rockets and engines were tested in the 1960s under the Rover Nerva programs, and then it just quit. And there are many of us that kind of wonder why. Uh, now, there was a rather large environmental anti-nuclear sentiment that rose up, uh, which in curtailed nuclear power in general in the country and shut down that program. It's only in the last few years then that that, that has been revived. Well, that's not totally true. Uh, between 1972 and 2000, about every seven years, NASA would do a relook at nuclear rockets and they always won the competition compared to chemical rockets, but NASA didn't like that answer. And so they would then go away. It's only in the last few years, NASA has started a nuclear thermal rocket program uh, with actually tens of millions of dollars in it. And it's only in this past year that DARPA has started a nuclear thermal rocket program. So it is revitalizing. Uh, if for those that don't understand nuclear thermal rockets, it's a hot plate that you blow hydrogen through that heats up, expands, and you blow it out a nozzle. There's no barely contained explosion. There's no chance for blowing up like we've seen in the, in the shuttles in the past. It's safer. It has twice the specific impulse, so you can get at least twice the payload or half the time on your missions. You can carry more shielding for the crew. It's a much better propulsion system, and they're just now starting to look at it. And uh, I'll let Troy talk about the how industry's effort in nuclear thermal rockets. But I would like to add something on that before Troy takes that away. Something else that people, I think, in the public don't understand is government rarely funds things because they're a good idea. Uh, uh, you know, they, they fund things because they think they have some government need some government mission that they need to they need to carry out and then and only then do they invest in the ways to carry out that mission you know the, the nuclear rocket program was not stopped because of environmental concerns and certainly not because of technical issues because it was going great it was stopped because there was no perceived government need to do anything more ambitious in space and there still is not uh you know so so the the Again, I, I, it's a mistake to look to the government to, as, the, as the avenue of solution to these problems because they don't think they need anything better than what they've got. Now, I, I could go off for an hour on why don't they think they need anything better than what they've got, um, but, the, but the reality is they don't. And, and the reason why nuclear rockets are, are appearing again now is because there are defense customers who are getting... Um, a resurgence of interest that there might be defense missions for which these capabilities would be useful again. And if that continues, then that will probably carry on. Now, I, on, on to Troy about te the technical of how we, what we're going to do about it. No, I think you're exactly right about the need and and why they might get involved in it. And with the uh, upcoming you know, space race and new interest in space, it's now that you're competing against other people that might be in the area, not just competing against yourself and seeing what you can do. Uh, I, I do think there was a, a little bit of technical challenges left over from the old programs. They had some materials concerns, um, especially if you're not allowed to use uh, bomb grade uranium, mm -hmm. um, you have to adjust what they were able to do back in the day to what is acceptable now. Uh, one of the topics that we're working on is called the Sprinter nuclear thermal rocket engine, which we use to, we have adjusted the geometry and the flow paths and the overall design of the old nuclear thermal rocket concepts into something that's more reliable, easier to manufacture, and we think it solves a lot of those problems of the, the, the breakdowns in materials. One of the things that is sometimes very surprising is just the, the temperatures and the stresses and things that we are dealing with with the nuclear thermal rocket is you want to get your propellant as absolutely hot as possible. And so you're pushing all of your materials to their absolute melting point. And you, you pick things like tungsten or graphite. And when these things get hot, you can't hold them with anything because they're the hottest things that there are. And so there's some tricky balances, some design concerns. I think that they made huge progress in the old 
Nerva program, solving a lot of these. They were almost there, and then they just didn't quite have the oomph at the end to finish it. And now that there's another push for it, and now that we've come up with this idea that we think is the big solution, we're very optimistic about the nuclear thermal rocket programs really taking off. Hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Weed, can you explain to us what the difference is between um, nuclear fission fusion and antimatter rockets? Yeah, sure. So fusion, uh, I'll start, actually I'll start with fission because that's probably what most people are uh, most familiar with. Um, so you take a large atom and you split it and, and you get some energy out. Um, you get a fraction of the percent of the rest mass of the, of the nuclear matter uh, out of that reaction. It's much more than a chemical reaction, uh, but still it's only, it's a fraction of a percent. Um, fu fusion is a little better um, in terms of uh, energy output uh, per reaction, um, but uh, that's taking light uh, atoms like hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, um, and fusing them together um, the sun does that, um, and we're trying to do that in magnetic uh, confinement traps, and we're trying to do it in inertial confinement traps here on Earth. Uh, it's uh, pretty difficult uh, to do. We haven't solved it yet, uh, but uh, the potential benefit for a fusion reactor is still out there. Um, and so antimatter is a little different uh, because uh, it's essentially converting all of the, the rest mass of, of a particle uh, into energy. Um, so if you have a, uh, an, an antiproton, uh, if you take a, a bunch of antiprotons from Jerry and, and you smash them up against a bunch of protons, you get uh, a lot of energy out. Um, well, pretty much E equals MC squared. Energy is mass, right? So that, all that mass turns into energy in uh, one form or the other. Um, and you can use that for various means, uh, propulsion or, or otherwise. Um, so that's kind of the gamut of uh, what, what we like to... the, the the realm that we like to play in here as advanced propulsion uh, scientists, but uh, there's uh, benefits and uh, and there's risks and uh, and there's uh, unknowns in each of these areas. Um, uh, and uh, I think part of our job is figuring out, uh, you know, how do we solve these problems with given given the material science uh, where it is right now, and uh, how do we how do we come up with a solution that uh, makes sense for a propulsion application? That's part of our job, I think. Why do we? Um, why don't we just pay SpaceX to get us there? Why do we need to look beyond chemical rockets? The well, part of the problem is, I mean, there's a misperception, especially in the general public, that you just throw money at something, and all of a sudden, magically, you get a solution and you can implement it next year. Now, that has been made worse, of course, by this recent pandemic and the fact that for the first time in human history we went from identifying a virus to having a vaccine in under a year. Okay, that was never ever true in human history. And for the first time it was true, okay? If you look at, for instance, uh, Apollo, landing a man on the moon, the technology required to get that to work uh, started 55 years earlier with Robert Goddard, okay, who did chemical rockets, he did staging, he did gyroscopes. I mean, he did all of that stuff, okay? And then nobody took it seriously until a couple of wars. And then no one decided to go to the moon until there was a space race and a perceived military reason for maintaining the high ground. And so Kennedy decided that we were going to get to the moon first. So it's, it's almost never about just putting money into a problem and finding a solution. The, the second problem is just because you throw money at a bunch of people doesn't mean they're going to innovate the, the, a good idea, okay? In fact, we see the opposite. If you wanted an aircraft, the last person you would have funded was the Wright brothers <laughs> who owned a bicycle shop, okay? But yet the government would have gone to Ford Motor or some other perceived related industry to try and get aircraft to work, Okay did in so, fact go to the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, this idea that somehow when you have the problem, you only then put the money in and you look for the solution within a year or two generally has not worked for humanity, okay? And so there is a need to have these crazy people with frizzy hair who uh, go off and think great thoughts once in a while. 
And I mean, if you look at history, I mean, you have, uh, you know, good, you have very good examples of, you know, the early inventors who had kings or other, you know, some sort of monarch or some other person who had money, who kind, they kept amused by discovering cool things for them. Okay. And that underwrote the, the serious work they were doing of expanding human knowledge. And I think all of us in this panel right now, at some level or another, are trying to do or try to follow in that in that um, in those footsteps. The you know for us the easiest, unfortunately, the easiest money sometimes is getting government money, but it's never that consistent. So it's kind of a trap to, that many of us sometimes fall into. I know, I mean, all of us have day jobs that are unrelated to our NIAC funding and, you know, the advanced propulsion stuff. We wouldn't be able to survive if, if we just um, lived on that money. So um, there, this model that the average person through crowdfunding gets involved financially, even at a dollar two level, with subjects they're interested in, hence make progress. I think that's one of the great new directions for humanity as a whole, to sort of, you know, take what people are interested in and make some progress on it without having to convince some government bureaucrat for a few years to fund it and then to have it not funded for another 20 years. I, I I'd like to say, say, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, oh. I, I'd like to hear yes, what please. you'd like to say. Um, the the, the 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 question you asked about chemical propulsion, I, I think you really have to to bear more clearly in mind the the magnitudes of energy you're talking about, right? The the going somewhere in space at a given time is about how fast you go, right? And the distances are large, so the if you want to go there faster, you got to go faster. The, 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 we, we are already as efficient as we're going to get in turning the energy of chemistry into velocity. There just isn't more energy in the chemicals to get out. And the velocities that we get that may seem fast to the ordinary person, but we're talking about, you know, kilometers or tens of kilometers per second. You know, that, that is a, a speed at which the outer solar system is years and years away. And anything farther than that is just out of reach. And every, every little bit more of speed that you want to get requires a vast increase in the amount of propellant that you burn. And there's no getting away from that except to use higher energy systems. And the importance of nuclear propulsion, the importance of non-rocket propulsion, the stuff I'm working on about harvesting the solar wind, is these are all higher quality sources of energy that give you more energy per amount of mass and they open up domains of speed that are utterly inaccessible to chemical rockets no matter how cleverly put together no matter how much money you spend that's actually exactly what i was going to say is that it, it's not only an issue of, of funding um there's also issues of public support and technological advancement and i wanted to kind of check with steve i know he's talked with this to great depth on his thoughts of how you progress from the, the different levels of energy, uh, just as a society, um, you know, what is acceptable and what is not and, and how we march through technological advancements on earth also kind of mirrors how we march through it in space. So I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that, Steve. No, uh, sure. Just, I, I've, I've jumped up and down for years that, um, Captain Nemo and his nuclear submarine, really couldn't exist. You, you can't make the quantum level. Now, some of my colleagues here may disagree because you're trying to make this huge quantum leap uh, in one technology, but it has to have a uh, underpinning of technologies, right? When Kirk and Spock came back in time, he couldn't make mnemonic memory circuits because he didn't have all the silicon parts and everything. So you've got to have the substructure to make the antimatter. To get to antimatter propulsion, we've got to be used to, as a society, to handling huge high power and high power density systems. And, and we're not there yet. All we've got are chemical rockets. So we, we've got to progress to 
fission-based systems where we can start talking hundreds of megawatts, maybe fusion-based systems, you can go a little bit more, then we can get to antimatter where we're talking hundreds of gigawatts. But we can't leap very easily uh, from, from where we're at to those kind of power densities because we just don't have the materials, we don't have the magnetic fields, we can't even build a hardly magnetic nozzle now for, for low temperature plasmas. And so there's an infrastructure that has to exist uh, that I think needs to be built. And, and so it does have a certain pace. I mean, we're all looking at advanced concepts to try to pick out the candle on the horizon, but then we got to say, all right, what's the next step toward getting toward that candle? We can't just jump to the candle, in my opinion. Uh, so with that, um, Dr. Weed, what, what is the candle on your horizon? I know that you're involved in some really exciting things at Positron Dynamics. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think there's just one candle out there. I think there's uh, many ways to, to skin the propulsion cat. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think some type of uh, hybrid uh, approach may be the best in the end. Um, you know, uh, fusion uh, fusion fuel is abundant in the universe. Uh, hydrogen is as out there; it's the most abundant uh, atom. Um, so it makes sense to to try and use that as a building block uh, to get outside of our solar system. Um, and so, we haven't solved the, the fusion problem here on Earth, but uh, I think we're pretty close. Um, I don't think it's thirty years, as they always say. Uh, I think fusion is is closer than that. Um, but the problem with fusion in space is that you typically need a lot of mass uh, to drive the fusion reaction. Um, so I think um, a solution to that is lowering the driver mass uh, and combining some type of hybrid, maybe, it, maybe it's antimatter, maybe it's fission, um, fusion hybrid uh, to get us outside of our solar system. That's kind of a, kind of a, if I had to build a, a rough sketch toward getting outside of our solar system, I'd probably include that. Dr. Jackson, um, with taking all of these types of um, technologies and applications into account, um, you are also involved in a, in a company, um, Greenlight Technologies. Does that focus on how these technologies can benefit where we're at and how we, we, we do things now here on Earth? Uh, well, sure. I mean, there's always a cross feed uh, when you're working on one technology, it always feeds into other um, areas. And I'm, I, I'm not going to talk about it here, but I mean, I've uh, since uh, very, very well, in the last few months, I have actually changed some of my direction. In fact, I have not looked for a phase two uh, NIAC grant for advanced propulsion because some of the stuff we learned is now applicable to generating power here on Earth. Okay, and so that's we're going in that direction, especially now with green energy and carbon, you know, not having carbon emissions and so on. There's a bigger pot of money and there's more societal uh, interest and there's more demand for those technologies than for the propulsion side. So we're going to take a breather for another two or three years or whatever it takes to pursue these other avenues. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to... Uh, or buttress what Ryan just said, uh, most of these things in the end, especially the beginning, are going to be combinations. I mean, Ryan's concept in NIAC was brilliant, where he was actually generating his antimatter along the way. I mean, inside, he was kind of breeding his own antimatter. And uh, it was a brilliant, I thought, a stroke of uh, innovation using nuclear processes and then including the antimatter in that and getting thrust out. Uh, in the same way, HBAR technologies, all the way back from Steve's original idea, the antimatter isn't the fuel, it's not the propellant, it's just the spark plug for generating nuclear fission events. Okay, and so, I mean, some of the early work that was done on pure antimatter propulsion was interesting, but they were looking at needing tons, metric tons of antimatter and that is way outside of our scope right now as a, as a race now creating nanograms we've done that already i mean we used to produce two or three nanograms a year here on earth all the time that's since been shut down we're not going to that's not going to get turned on again in the near future but uh, one of the things that hbar 
has been in in the so HBAR was working on propulsion where we're pushing forward the production of antimatter, the storage of antimatter, and the utilization of that antimatter as a spark plug for these fission uh, reactions. We'll continue to do that in the background, but as you pointed out, uh, right now we've just identified a offshoot technology that we're going to concentrate on more closely that's relevant here to Earth. Right. And Troy, can you um, tell the audience that you have three different projects right now at Howe Industries. Um, can, can you give us a little overview on that? Yeah, we actually have quite a few different projects because we do mostly operate with this um, grant research uh, paradigm. And so the idea is that we'll brainstorm, uh, we submit to NIAC or SBIRs or other funding avenues. And so they're not always exactly the same technology. Um, like I had mentioned, the Sprinter thermal rocket, that was originally done in a NASA SBIR in 2017. And that's kind of where we got most of our conceptual work done with that and we've been pursuing that and then we uh have have got some funding to continue on that this year and hopefully can then continue to grow that topic from the nuclear rocket side but we also did a, a nasa NIAC about nuclear electric propulsion and we had an idea for an advanced thermoelectric generator like they use on the rtgs for deep space power sources our concept actually really increases that efficiency. And our our models are suggesting something like a 20% conversion efficiency. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to pursue that through the NIAC and SBIR programs. And we actually had a very successful test just a few weeks ago to demonstrate that feasibility. Um, and, and we had about a four times increase in the in the efficiency of a single thermoelectric junction by using our method. So we're very optimistic about that. Um, the thermoelectrics are great for things like the MMRTG or fission surface power, deep space power, but also for terrestrial power. If you've got a small modular reactor or a forward deployed reactor, and now you don't have working fluids and gaskets and seals, and you can just basically plant a, a small reactor uh, bury it in some concrete and you have two wires coming out that power the houses in the area, you know, that's a big step in the right direction, we think, for kind of getting nuclear technologies into regular use on Earth. And so we try to have both the far out ideas, maybe not quite as far out as some of the guys here, but, um, you know, once we figure out all the inner workings that are necessary, we try to bring that back towards um, our terrestrial and near-term use. And then our other big project they're working on is a uh, solar thermal propulsion systems for CubeSats, which is not gonna help us get to interstellar travel. But for this stellar travel, it's actually not so bad. The sun is a great source of power for for running around in Earth orbit. So we, we shoot all sorts of ideas out. Um, the ones that kind of are agreed upon that seem promising, we're able to pursue. It is kind of hectic sometimes because it's up to these review panels, but we've made some really good progress and we're really excited about the way things are going so far. We should have some good answers. So when you talk about um, using these applications for terrestrial power, um, I, I think that uh, Dr. Weed explores this as well. Is it safe? Is it clean? I think that a lot of people are a little concerned about the safety levels of employing this method of, of gaining energy. Can can both of you speak on that? Do you want to start, Ryan? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, luckily, uh, most of the antimatter concepts right now, uh, or at least the ones that, that I've been working on, don't rely on a on a massive chunk of antimatter. Um, once you once you start building up a ch your chunk of antimatter, that's when things start getting dangerous. Um, unless you have a very stable means of uh, you know, holding that and trapping it, and it's very it's a very unstable by its nature. Um, so if you, if you can somehow, uh, as Jerry mentioned earlier, uh, produce or breed the antimatter or a radioisotope that emits the antimatter as you go, then I think that's a much safer proposition uh, for for launching something uh, into space. I, I definitely also think that there's a a correlation between the, I guess, 
hazard levels and capabilities that new technologies bring. If if you didn't have fire, then you know you wouldn't have fire damage, but you also wouldn't be able to stay warm in the winter. If you didn't have cars, you know there's a huge amount of energy in just you driving a car to work every day, but it, it can be very dangerous, but it's not a problem for our society because we're so used to it and it's so necessary and so beneficial. So yes, with nuclear or antimatter or whatever we develop, there's the potential for it to cause damage, but we have to get to that point where the benefits are outweighing that, uh, that threat, I suppose, and where everyone's comfortable with it and where we gradually evolve into that position where it becomes part of day-to-day -day life. And, and we can use it for good, as it were. How do we, and, and this is a question for Jeff, how do we take these capabilities and, and point them at going faster, farther, quicker um, in a single lifetime? One of the things that has been really um, great for me getting involved with the Tau Zero Foundation is that when you really force yourself to look at interstellar propulsion seriously the energy requirement daunting that that a huge pile of solutions that can be immediately dismissed is just not good enough uh, so it forces you to look in in some new territory i'm going to put that in perspective if you wanted to go only at 20 percent of the speed of light um and you carried your energy with you and your whole ship was a hydrogen bomb, the best hydrogen bomb we can build, and you converted all that energy into propulsion, you would still be 70 times short of the amount of energy you need to put into the starship. Uh, so so if, if, if you, either, you either give up, which is not in my nature, or, or you get creative. Um, and the way to get creative is to, to face the magnitude of the energy and what you have quickly come to is you can't just carry it all with you. You either have to send it to the ship so that it's not on board so that you don't have that high energy content, or you have to find sources where you can gather it on the way. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about is the applications of some of the technologies of uh, harvesting the solar wind. Uh, the solar wind, you know, the, the sun is this big nuclear bomb that's constantly going off at the middle of the solar system. Um, and it sends high speed particles out. Uh, and uh, those particles go about 700 kilometers per second when you're outside the plane of the ecliptic. And to put that in perspective, that's more than 20 times the kind of speed that we currently exploit for moving around the solar system. Uh, and it's free. It's just right there. Um, you know, there, when you get out into the interstellar medium, um, you know, it's, it's a source of reaction mass, it's a source of wind that you can use for extracting energy and it's already there. Um, and when it comes to collecting large amounts of energy, I do keep an eye on what's going on with the various fusion systems because fusion fuel is cheap and we can figure out how to use it. There's an awful lot of energy to be harvested there. And if you don't know, the outer solar system is practically made of fusion fuels. Uh, you know, the, the, the outer gas giants, Jupiter, uh, uh, Uranus, and Neptune are full of these things in their atmospheres. Uh, they're not scarce. Uh, so if you can collect them and transmit that energy through power beaming or other means, pellet streams to the starship, um, it becomes possible to collect that kind of energy up into something without somehow needing something that's you know five times better than antimatter, which we're not going to find. Uh, the you know so it, it's it's a case of face up to their requirements. But I think what's so exciting about that for the for the terrestrial applications again is, you know these are the same questions that any civilization should be asking. We're going to need a lot more energy in the future. What it costs is going to matter. You know, how are we going to access that energy, store it, manipulate it, transform it into useful purposes? You know, that is the kind of question that has governed the advance of civilization throughout human history. And I think that asking these questions in a space context is powerful because it's the kind of arena where 10% better just isn't good enough. You know, you, you, you have to at, look for the revolutionary improvements. And when we find them, they will have terrestrial applications. 
Um, my next question is for uh, Dr. Sihau. I, I know that you um, are, are also an author of fiction, and a lot of times our 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 information and how we perceive how these technologies are applied, you know, they come from fictional interpretation. And so, is it really possible to have interstellar travel through normal space, or or must we envision a, a subspace? So this is a question I raised some time ago, um, and it's kind of along the line of once we started looking at the Oort cloud. And so the Oort cloud is a spherical cloud of primordial material that ranges in size from, you know, grains of sand to big chunks. And so I started thinking about this. This looks to me like a cell wall in a body, and there's a barrier. And I got to thinking if we go to, to Jeff's 20% speed of light, Actually, I use 10% speed of light. And if every solar system has an Oort cloud, which we don't know necessarily, but I guess we can assume so, then you're entering into their Oort cloud at 10% the speed of light, and a grain of sand is equivalent to 400 tons of TNT when it hits you. So our is the the stellar neighborhood our, our stars in our galaxy protected from normal transport through normal space if you really got to get up to these kind of speeds then you got a problem when you get there and if you slow down so that the grain of sand doesn't sandblast you into bits it takes you an awful long time to do that 10,000 au into the solar system so this is a as you said I get into the fiction world and uh, and get into the science fiction world. This was kind of an indication that if you're going to have interstellar travel, you've got to go through some other uh, subspace so you don't see those grains of sand or you have to warp space, a la Star Trek, where it warps around the ship. I mean, you can invoke that if you want. But so, uh, it, you know, and, and, and it's kind of fun. You're, you're correct. I kind of play the science fiction side sometimes. And NIACs are right on that border, right? You're supposed to kind of think of science fiction stuff that might be feasible. And uh, so it's kind of worked uh, well sometimes. I haven't made much money off of science fiction, <laughs> but it's been fun to write it, let's put it that way. It's, uh, it's also, uh, I would like, if I could, raise a, a, another question, if I could, Rhonda, and that's back to Jeff's point about uh, motivation. The governments do things because they want something. They want to achieve something. And of course, this is why wars have pushed technology over the eons. They need better performance. And so how do we get motivation for this kind of interstellar missions or deep space missions or even missions to the, the icy moons? Uh, you know, can one, the governments aren't going to care about that. Can one get a, a private what do you want to call it? A social group, a private group that can put up private money to pursue the technologies just because you want to go find life at Enceladus. You know, I think this falls into the private venture world and Elon and SpaceX have kind of shown this. He's doing what he wants and he's doing a lot faster. Uh, so, so I'm not sure that the NIACs, as pointed out earlier, is enough money to do much. We all like pursuing it, but we need some other uh, mechanism where, you know, there's a, a, a cluster of private money and we all go compete for uh, real. Now, one could argue the Breakthrough uh, uh, Institute is trying to do that. I haven't followed them of late. You guys can tell me where they're at, perhaps, Jeff, uh, and their postage stamp to the stars. So um, I don't know. Is that... Does that solve the problem? Does the Breakthrough Institute solve the problem? I don't think so, but I, I, I'm thrilled with what they're doing. I think they're making great progress. I would, I would, I think they're contributing. I would okay. certainly not regard them as quote unquote having solved the problem. Right. Um, you know, the the, uh, the this is not the kind the, the outer solar system inter, interstellar flight is, is a grand technological challenge. You know, it, it is not the kind of it is not the kind of problem, you know, where the hero um, with the frizzy hair, you know, shouts Eureka at the top of the hour and you're doing it by the time that the credits roll. 
uh, the, the, it involves an awful lot of capabilities and an awful lot of breakthroughs and a lot of different areas that have to come together. Um, it really needs a, a more systemic approach right. than the kind of haphazard, you know, target of opportunity that we've been that we've been doing. Um, the the really what I keep coming back to is energy is fundamental. Space transportation is an is an energy problem. Um, and there are lots of other uses for for energy breakthroughs. And and we need to we need to find private or public or or public private partnership interests that are that are, that are interested in looking at it in both of those contexts. Space is a great arena to think about it in because you need it um, and you have lots of elbow room and there's not much to hurt. So it's a great place to learn how to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, but that's not necessarily the reasons why you would do it. And government has not so good about looking out of the pigeonhole that they're, that they're in for why they want to do this particular thing. Historically, philanthropic types of interests and, and for-profit types of interests have perhaps been better sources for that. Um, you know, we have challenges as a society um, in the Western democracies in the post-World War II environment for various historical reasons. We kind of centralized the funding of research in a way that was not characteristic in the pre-World War II environment. You know, it used to be that private individuals and, and endowments at colleges and cities and states and municipalities and, and whatnot were all co-equal partners in terms of funding streams as well as the central government for research. And in the in the Cold War and post-World War II environment, that changed. And it produced great results for a while because there was this low-hanging fruit of, of, of half a century of advancement that was waiting to be turned into technological reality that we accelerated very quickly the rate at which we turned it into technological reality. What's going on right now is the pantry is kind of bare. Uh, you know, the fundamental science breakthroughs are lagging. The the creative early ideas that have been demonstrated in the lab are lagging. Um, and it's we're no longer in the situation where money spent on applications can immediately produce the big impressive results, as was said earlier. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of in a situation where we have to go back and restock the pantry uh, and and do some more fundamental research, do some more of the early innovative stuff so that, you know, those, th which is a case where you need more actors with perhaps less level of funding per actor uh, rather than a couple of giant flagship projects. Um, how we're going to get back to that, that's a complex question. I don't, if I knew the answer, we'd have done it already, uh, but we can at least address the magnitude of the problem and start looking for how we're going to solve it. I think that one of the things that, that would be really beneficial for, for everyone watching is, is to get a better handle on, on what we're talking about with regards to costs. You had mentioned that a lot of uh, pre-phase uh, one projects are funded in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but aren't these endeavors in the billions of dollars? I, how? How do we get there? How much does this cost? What are we looking for in terms of funding um, to, to bring near-term results? I'll let Troy take that one for us. I mean, ours are a little bit more near-term than the interstellar plans. Certainly, if you wanted a long-term power source for a generation ship and take a long time, uh, you know, we have technologies that could maybe help you have electricity. Um, but I think with the advancements that have been made in kind of the, the nuclear rocket and the nuclear electric and the fission propulsion sides, um, you know, we're now thinking that we can get the Sprinter nuclear thermal rocket completely formed and up in orbit for about 150 million, which is not too bad. It's not money that I have, but uh, as far as uh, nuclear rocket in space goes, the price has gone way down because we now have the manufacturing and the materials and the knowledge that they didn't have decades ago. Um, and same with the uh, new fission reactors, the nuclear electric propulsion system we're working on with the uh, ATEGs called the Spear uh, spacecraft. Um, you know, that, that launches on a a vehicle that's a $50 million launch. So you can have private entities now 
sending spacecraft all throughout the solar system uh, for tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but it's at least down from the billions, hopefully soon. I don't know if you guys have other predictions on. Yeah, so if you, uh, if you put this in a, a little bit of context, uh, for going from the Wright brothers to the SR-71, uh, going from 20 meters a second to 20,000 meters a second, uh, or three orders of magnitude, um, we need something, a similar increase in our propulsion capability. Uh, and that took, what, 60 years and probably a, a significant fraction of GDP. Uh, so uh, I don't want to put a number on building an antimatter rocket, but it's going to be sustained effort over multiple years uh, to even get close to, to developing or proving this technology in space. Um, so it's it's not something that a NIAC grant is going to do alone, uh, but um, you know these, it's a good starting point. Yeah, it's not even something an individual is going to do. I'm under no illusion that I will be alive when somebody finally uses this. Okay, in fact, all of science is based on standing on the shoulders of the people before you, and part of the problem I see actually in the basic research is everybody wants to to win the Nobel Prize in their lifetime, okay? And they're not willing to do the sort of basic slug, you know, slugging through these problems and getting the, the baseline information necessary so the next generations can make the big jumps, okay? And um, we, we have to be doing a lot of this basic stuff. And uh, you could do it with, Let's, I mean, if, you, if you're restricted to the sort of NIAC level where you get 150,000 once every five years and then you have to, you know, kind of do it as a hobby in between, you will make progress. I mean, there's nothing God-given about how fast you have to make technological progress as a species. But it's certainly not the optimum way of doing it, okay? It's not, it's not the best way to run the railroad. But uh, if that's the way that we're forced to do it. We've, I mean, we've done it for millennia as a species. We can do it in the future too. Well, the most expensive thing on my shopping list right now is a demonstrator of the plasma magnet solar sail, um, which would, we're still costing that out, but that would probably be in the low tens of millions of dollars. And that would get you 700,000 uh, meters per second kind of velocities. Um, which is Pluto in six months. Um, the Because the wind is already there, you didn't have to bring it with you, so it's cheaper. Um, the, the, but we have lots of projects where there's, you know, individual researchers who just need, you know, a grad student and some equipment to go into the lab and show something fundamental. You know, and that th those go down to the range of like a hundred thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars a year for a few years um, to to do the critical demonstration of showing that this is an idea that might work. You know that that doesn't build you a working system, but it's in some ways the more important part of the puzzle. Um, and then if you you know we want to talk about really far out stuff. You know, Stephen mentioned you know space warping or or metric engineering, as I like to call it. You know that is not that is not crazy. Um, serious people are working on it. Two really good papers got published this year, um, but but that's an area where even the most basic laboratory investigation of the questions is not being done. Uh, and it's also it's worth noting. You know, I think people for science fictional purposes look at that and kind of hope it's the shortcut way. It's probably not. You know, the, 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 any, any idea we have about how to manipulate space time is also very energy intensive um, and probably is more likely to be enabled by the kinds of breakthroughs we've been talking about in the nearer term than it is likely to make them obsolete. Uh, so the, but again, you know, the, that, that's a field where all the work's being done by academics who all have tenure and are doing it, you know, in their spare time. It's their evenings and weekends kinds of project. I don't think there's anybody on the planet for whom this is their full-time job. Uh, you know, and it and how much money would it take to change that? You know, you're talking about an effectively endowing a couple of professors to work on it. You know, it's not you're not talking about millions of dollars. Uh, 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 
based on our previous comments, this would be something everyone would want <laughs> if we had a subspace communicator. So maybe there's something going on behind the fence we don't know. That'd be nice. <laughs> well, the Vulcans haven't landed yet, so they know we're not ready for it. That's right. <laughs> So what what does the roadmap to interstellar look like? I mean, what are the next steps? Where where are we at right now and and how can we shorten or take fewer steps to get there? I don't know if you can take fewer steps. I mean, uh, uh, Jeff and I have just uh, we're writing up our final report for our NIAC phase one. And it's astonishing when you look at the write up. How many assumptions are unsubstantiated in, you know, the density of the interstellar gas, the magnetic field in the interstellar medium. The, uh, we, uh, along the way, we want to do a survey of Oort cloud objects, okay? I mean, what sort of, what are their temperatures? What are, the, what, are what are their dynamics? What is their velocity through the interstellar medium? Do you see um, uh, magnetic uh, wakes? in the plasma due to these ice balls flowing through the plasma. We have no idea. We don't know the detection limits. We don't know even some of the driving terms. So before we could even ra rash, okay, so part of the problem is uh, the, the missions to the interstellar are going to be driven by planetary scientists, okay? They don't want to take technical risk. So they want to use old technology to get them there, okay? That is a fundamental mismatch, okay? There's, I'm in the field of accelerator physics. That's where I was trained. And there was a very, very, one of the founding fathers of accelerator physics was named Robert Wilson. He came out of the Manhattan Project, did a lot of very interesting work, was a brilliant physicist. He said, if you ever build a boring accelerator, you've done a disservice to humanity. Okay, every accelerator should be novel and new and at risk of not working. So if every accelerator that you build works first try, then you've done something wrong. <laughs> the same philosophy, so philosophy should be true for rocket engines and for propulsion systems. There should be a, a huge amount, there should be, a, it, you know, for instance, getting on the Conestoga wagon and making it to the Midwest was a 50-50 survival proposition. Most people alive today don't realize that. Okay, There's, there needs to be a 50-50 chance that your rocket will fail. Now, unfortunately, that's probably true for getting out of Earth orbit anyway. But for these missions that are going out in the outer solar system, if you look at the Mars landers, except for the British, we've been actually exceptionally successful. I mean, we didn't burrow Beagle into Mars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but everything else has actually landed pretty successfully. So there hasn't been, you could argue that they haven't been taking enough risk. Now, uh, they play up the retro rockets and the drogue shoots and how risky this all is, and it makes for good TV. But in reality, every technology they used to land the latest rover was developed at the time of Goddard back in 1920. So, so Jerry, given our previous comments that um, well, the government doesn't like to take risk, and we're going to be talking about extremely high energy densities and energy levels. It kind of seems antithetical to, to have a propulsion development station on the surface of the Earth. I You're agree. Risking the biosphere. So is this the motivation for the lunar base, just to develop high energy density propulsion? Uh, and well, at a minimum, I, I, that's where I, I think that it should be done on the moon. I think that's one of many little straws on the camel's back where we're saying all of this, like, for instance, you know, all this uh, high risk uh, DNA research where we're trying to create new viruses and stuff. Mm -hmm. We're nuts to do that down here. OK, that should be done on a base somewhere where you could isolate it and let it die off if something happens. Okay. Hold those the crater and move on. Yeah, right. The, the, uh, much much are, more so than the, the, the high energy density stuff. I, yeah. I think the moon is is our gift for biotechnology research, and we are we are fools not to use it. Yeah. But yeah, it's well, it's it, sorry. It's like trying to convince somebody that a fax machine is a good idea when you only have one. Okay. I mean, it's, it's very hard to sell that. Okay. Right now, everybody is kind of okay with the status quo, so 
the motivation for getting to the moon is always, you know, we have enough problems on Earth. Why are we trying to create new problems? I mean, you, you're always fighting that philosophy. And, you know, yes, we can take risks here on Earth, but we can mitigate them. You know, the pandemic probably is disproving that. But, uh, you know, uh, we, there has to be a small group of people with the means to just make it happen. And waiting for a government to do it is not going to happen, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the roadmap, you you have to think that you have to think of commercial applications on, on that roadmap, right? So I mean, right. the moon is clear that maybe Mars is clear, but beyond that, it's very difficult to think up uh, of commercial applications uh, for the roadmap to interstellar space. Um, so, I mean, Delta V is what we're all shooting for, right? Um, we can prove that in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. Delta V is important, but you can probably solve that problem with chemical. Um, beyond the moon, Mars, it gets a little more challenging with chemical. Um, so if we can come up with a good reason uh, and a commercial uh, application for high Delta V propulsion beyond moon Mars system, I think that would be a driving factor to get us onto that roadmap uh, outside our solar system. I mean, there are clear uh, you know, as astronomical targets outside of the solar system, like the solar gravitational lens. Uh, but I don't think that's enough of a, a big enough target uh, to, to justify spending the amount of money you would need to develop a propulsion system to get there quickly. Um, so yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. And I think it's unsolved. So in, in closing, um, like a closing question on all of this, uh, and Jeff, this is for you. Um, and I know that you have a hard stop, so you have to leave. But do you think that NASA will ever find the political support to engage in robotic interstellar exploration um, to truly invest large sums of advanced propulsion for a, for a crude flight? Wow. <laughs> okay, at the risk of, of closing on a highly contentious question, NASA as an agency is is not structured correctly for current national needs. Um, the the you know NASA was created um, for for the political exigencies of its day, um, and it, and in creating it, we cannibalized a predecessor agency, the NACA, which had been very successful, instrumental really, in advancing aviation technology. Um, and, and we, you know, in time of cold war pressed that agency into service to achieve certain political purposes that have long since been achieved. Um, you know, the United States desperately needs an entity who was chartered and funded and, and whose culture is oriented towards continuously improving the efficiency, speed, performance, effectiveness, et cetera, of space vehicles. Um, we have an agency for whom that is their charter. It's called NASA, but it's not their mission. It's not their job. Nobody cares. Uh, that's not what they, why, why they're there. Um, I don't know if NASA can be turned back into an agency that has that mission, or if it would make more sense to start another one. Um, but that's a that's an unmet national need. So will NASA in its current form perform that function ever? Probably not. Um, will NASA in its current form continue to exist forever? Probably not. Uh, uh, because sooner or later, the United States will re reinvent this capability for a technology push agency, which is not NASA's current function or the United States will cease to be a great power um, and some other nation state will will uh, take on that function. Uh, because, you know, push, pushing, historically, these kinds of technologies always find other uses. They find other civilian uses, they find other military uses. You simply can't push the ability to harness useful energy to higher and higher levels without having it be useful for other things. Um, so the decision that we made in 1958 to cannibalize the agency whose job it was to do those things was short-sighted. Uh, and, and we need to find some way to fill that gap again. 
right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to go back to Troy. Um, if you had closing arguments for the involvement for how industries, what would they be? Um, I guess we we really want to focus on on showing that we can advance technology in the right direction. And even though we aren't necessarily participating in the interstellar mission right now, it does give us and everyone a uh, direction. Like, like Steve had said, the candle on the horizon. We know where to look. We know why with all these great ideas on, on why should we uh, colonize the moon? Why should we look into the asteroid mining? everything that pushes us towards the right direction is things that we can develop uh, that are a little bit more near term and then more and more near term until they're terrestrial. And so our goal is to be right there in the middle where we're making things more robust, the nuclear technologies, the space travel technologies, right on the edge of what's achievable and pull that into what is currently achievable. And so I think if we're able to really, you know, continue on the path that we've been doing, we'll be able to make a lot of the sci-fi stuff, regular science stuff, and get one step closer towards that interstellar mission whenever it may happen. Okay, and, and Ryan, what, 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 would you, would you, what would your similar commentary be for positron dynamics? Well, I, I would say that uh, what we've been working on, what we're trying to do is move from, from crazy idea to feasible to prototype to product, right? Uh, that's the whole idea behind it. having a private company involved in advanced propulsion is that you you generally want to move things towards uh, something that is useful um, in space. Um, and so we're we're pretty early on in that uh, in that process. Um, but uh, we think we think that uh, antimatter in general, uh, positrons are 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 way too. Uh, Way too energy dense to just to just to leave uh, in the basement of hospitals, uh, and, and uh, so I think um, you know Jerry and I are working in a difficult area, uh, antimatter, um, because uh, it's incredibly hard to create antimatter in, for, in the first place, um, and working on these challenges can can get frustrating uh, just from the funding side and and also from just progressing the technology, um, but it, it is. The payoff in the end, I think, is is worth worth the challenge and the frustration, and uh, we're happy. I think you know, I'm happy to be working in this area. So, great, Dr. Jackson, what say you for H bar Technologies? Well, back in 2000, Steve Howe grabbed me, took me out of a nice paying job, <laughs> and got me <laughs> into the entrepreneurial world, and. Uh, and it's been a wild ride. I mean, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Okay, yeah. it's been 20 years. He did me a great favor. I, I, we're friends. We will always be friends. He's been a mentor to me, and uh, I thank him. Now, having said that, I'm a, also a scientist, okay? And I like to maintain my scientific credentials. And so, but I also have a family and I have to feed them and I have employees and I have to feed them. So it turns out that our approach is a all of the above scenario. So to maintain my scientific credentials, to get publications, to kind of push the envelope of, of technologies and of ideas, the antimatter propulsion work is fits that bill, okay? And so that that's fine. What we do from time to time is we find spin-off technologies or new applications for the stuff that we've come up with and formed new companies. So right now I'm running three companies because we have two spin-offs that have come out of work that both times originated with the uh, antimatter work and in, in HBAR technologies. And so that in 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 that in those situations, I've raised nine million dollars from private investors, from individual investors, from small businesses, and so on. Uh, none of the neither of those other two companies ever took a dime of government money. And uh, in that way, we're stable enough that we can pay, make payroll. You know, we can expand. We're doing good things. We have patents. I mean, when you're working with antimatter, there's no point in patenting. Right. I mean, it's so far off that there's no 
20 year economic return to protect. But in these other applications, in order to feed our families, you have to have patents, you have to maintain, you know, intellectual property security. You don't want to be blabbing what you're up to in those uh, various applications. So you have to do both, okay? And uh, so hopefully in the near future, one of these other outside applications will end up hitting big and will fund all the rest of the HBAR and the antimatter stuff and we'll be able to make better progress. In the meantime, for us, a much better model would be to get, you know, be able to bring in a steady 60,000 a year for 10 years. Okay, so that we could hire some students, we could have summer interns, we could bring the next generation into this and train them up. You can't do that when you have nine months of funding and then nothing for six years, okay? And so that's why we're looking at crowdfunding because we think that's the way to go just in the last two weeks, I've had three emails from people who found out about me on the internet and want to help fund me. Okay, three people aren't enough, but there's some combination of Kickstarter or some other mechanism that we're exploring that might be a way to find that steady income so that we can uh, make 10 times faster progress than the current model. All right. And we have a little bit of lag in the system here, so let's just pause for a second. And Steve Howe, what, what would you say in, in your, your closing commentary? So I guess I just want to um, support what Troy said, but maybe twist it just a little bit. I think what Howe Industries is working on is what I was mentioning a bit earlier is the infrastructure technologies. We kind of see from a mission standpoint, you know, as, as uh, Ryan pointed out, the various Delta Vs, the energy densities required, uh, what kind of power, what kind of mass. And then we kind of drill down and say, what small technology in the next few years is needed to make that happen? So these advanced thermoelectric generators Troy's talking about totally revolutionize the space power. It's a much lower mass, same efficiency as dynamic systems, but we can package it. Now that's potentially applicable to all kinds of earth-based systems. And, and so it's a fundamental infrastructure that is broad and the same thing with the, the sprinter fuel for the nuclear rocket. If we can solve the fuel problem, then the nuclear rocket becomes possible. So I think that's what we're looking for is these basic technologies. And then along the line, what Jerry's saying is exactly right. Along that path, we always find these spinoffs. And the goal is to hit a spinoff that makes us several billion dollars so we can fund the lunar base ourselves. <laughs> we just haven't got that. We have found a way, we think, to produce materials for cancer research. Uh, that's going to be brand new. We think we have a way of doing that. Uh, and it's a spinoff. Uh, that that uh, from from our research, so it's fundamental research, well, not fundamental, but infrastructure research. But it underpins all the missions and uh, and everything that we want to do in the future. So, that's, uh, well, great, gentlemen. Thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you for all that you've brought with you in your conversations and updating us on on where we really are in these efforts and. Um, and with that, I guess I guess we'll just close the conversation. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye. Wow, that was a fantastic panel. Very insightful, wonderful conversation. I hope that that provided you all with some insight as to what some of the obstacles are uh, in achieving interstellar, but also how close we are, how close we are to getting there and how much more affordable it is today than it was 50 years ago. And that trend will continue. If you'd like to support us, please hit like or subscribe or both visit us at Patreon. The Tau Zero Foundation is always accepting donations. And I can get you in touch specifically 
with any of these folks that we represented today, be it HBAR Technologies, Tau Industries, Positron Dynamics, and of course the Tau Zero Foundation. We'll see you next time and thank you for joining us.